Thank you. The Committee on Homeland Security will come to order. The committee is meeting today to examine the work that the Department of Homeland Security is doing to assist state and local officials to secure election infrastructure, including voting machines, vote tallying systems, and voter databases. In addition to election security, we will also examine DHS's role working across all 16 critical infrastructures uh, because a cyber threat to elections may pose a similar threat to other critical infrastructure sectors. I now recognize myself for an opening statement. Our democratic system and critical infrastructures are under attack. In 2016, Russia meddled in our presidential election through a series of cyber attacks and information warfare. Their goals were to undermine the credibility of the outcome and sow discord and chaos among the American people. This was a provocative attack against our country. We must not allow it to happen again. I have stated repeatedly and long before the last election that foreign interference in our democracy cannot be tolerated. I strongly believe we'll be targeted again this November in the midterm elections, and we need to be prepared. And that is why we included $380 million in grants to the Election Assistance Commission and $26 million to the Department of Homeland Security for Election Infrastructure in FY18. These funds will enhance election technology and bolster cyber readiness. However, malicious use of the internet and the exploitation of social media are not just aimed at our election systems. In March, the FBI and DHS reported that Russian hackers attacked American nuclear power plants, crippling or shutting down major parts of our energy sector would be catastrophic. Russia has already done this to our allies. In 2015, a cyber attack turned off electricity for hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians. And last year, I stood on the front lines of Russia's cyber war in Ukraine and saw the effects firsthand. Nation state hacking is real and it's dangerous. Unfortunately, Russia is not the only villain. Between 2011 and 2013, Iranian hackers attack dozens of U.S. banks and try to shut down a dam in New York. In 2014, Chinese hackers stole 22 million security clearances from OPM, including my own. These attacks and others are part of a greater onslaught being waged against the United States. As a result, I've made strengthening our cybersecurity a top priority of this committee. In the past year, we have passed legislation to create the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency to elevate and operationalize the cybersecurity mission at DPS, DHS, authorize cyber incident response teams to assist local and state officials in identifying cyber risks and restoring essential services, and reauthorize DHS to ensure it offers services to local and state election officials upon request. We are proud of these accomplishments, but we can always do more. So today's hearing gives us a chance to offer new ideas and promote new solutions to help protect our elections and other critical infrastructures. I'd like to thank the witnesses uh, for being here today. We're uh, grateful for your service to the country uh, and expertise and look forward to working with each of you. And with that, the chairman now recognizes the ranking member. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you for holding today's hearing on election security. I too would like to congratulate and thank Undersecretary Krebs for being here today. Uh, good seeing you. I look forward to working with you to make sure DHS legislative authorities and responsibilities related to cybersecurity are well understood and to ensure that the department has the resources it needs to carry out the mission effectively. Undersecretary, you've taken the job at a critical moment in our nation. 
However, I'm concerned you do not have the support you need from the White House. You are responsible for building private sector confidence in DHS information sharing programs like automated indicator sharing after President Trump toyed with the idea of planting an absurd story to discredit its own, for its own political purposes. You are responsible for securing federal networks at a time when the White House National Security Advisor has decided to eliminate the National Security Council's cybersecurity coordinator. You're responsible for helping secure critical infrastructure networks for a White House that would rather save jobs in China uh, than heed the advice of intelligence community on supply chain vulnerabilities and you are responsible for helping state and local governments secure election infrastructures following Russia's brazen election meddling efforts in 2016, which the president has been reluctant to call out and which congressional Republicans until recently were content to ignore. As we sit here today, President Trump is in Europe complicating your mission. Instead of working, with our European allies to confront Russia, a shared adversary whose attempts to undermine Western democratic institutions are growing more and more bold, he is trolling them to curry favor with Russian President Vladimir Putin. President Trump has said he will address Russia's 2016 election meddling in a meeting with Putin, but he has never demonstrated a credible ability to confront Putin in our intelligence community's findings. He's predicted his meetings with Putin may be the easiest. So I know and I have no reason to believe anything productive will come of it. This president's failure to take seriously the threat of our democracy is one of the main reasons that we must do effective and thorough oversight in this body. Although I'm pleased that the majority has finally scheduled today's hearing, I'm disappointed that the majority failed to invite a full range of stakeholders, including the Election Assistance Commission, a hold a hearing at a time when DHS's federal partners were available to participate. It's important to note for the record that committee Democrats have been requesting official oversight activities on election security since before the 2016 election. And in March 2017, after months of inaction by the Republican majority, I introduced a resolution of inquiry seeking information from the department on its activities relating to counter, countering Russian election interference in the 2016 presidential election so we would understand how to protect our elections in the future. It was unceremoniously rejected along party lines. Committed Democrats have written to the chairman no less than five times since August 2016 to request a hearing, briefing, or investigation on vulnerabilities to our election infrastructure. We've also reiterated these requests on numerous occasions on the record. Despite these repeated requests, this committee did not conduct a formal hearing or briefing on the topic until April 2018. 15 months after the intelligence community released this report concluding that the Russian government had attempted to interfere in the 2016 elections and would attempt to do so again. When the Trump administration's six top intelligence officials testified before the Senate that Russia was targeting our 2018 elections, this committee, the committee that prides itself on acting in the wake of current issues, followed suit of the House Republican Conference by shirking its responsibility to act on this urgent threat. Ranking members of the Oversight and Government Reform Committee, the Foreign Affairs Committee, Judiciary Committee, the Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence, the House Armed Services, uh, and the House Administration Committee have all urged the chairs of Speaker Ryan to aggressively address this ongoing national threat. Our calls for actions were ignored, responded to with a half-hearted acknowledgement of the threat and a vague promise for future action, or the offer to ask a government witness about election security 
at a hearing on another topic. Because of our request for thorough hearings and briefings were denied, some committee Democrats joined the Democrats on the Committee of House Administration to form the Congressional Task Force on Election Security. I openly asked Republicans to join us and submit their ideas, yet no Republican member provided their input or attended the task force's public events. After studying the topics for eight months, meeting with stakeholders and holding a series of forums and briefing, the task force produced a report and introduced legislation to implement the recommendations. Mr. Chairman, I have a stack of requests made by Democrats for action on election security. Copy of the report on legislation I reference and other election security oversight documents, and I act that they be entered into record at this time. Without objection, so ordered. H.R. 5011, the Election Security Act, currently has over 100 co-sponsors, all Democrats. The legislation would, among <clears throat> other things, provide ongoing support to state and local governments to secure election infrastructure instead of addressing election challenges crisis to crisis direct the Department of Homeland Security to address the resources it needs to carry out its election security responsibilities and submit a request to Congress and establish mechanisms to ensure that state election officials have timely access to actionable threat information. I've asked the committee to consider H.R. 5011 and today renew my request for consideration of this legislation. Even though Congress appropriated some additional funding for DHS and the states to improve election security in the FY 2018 <coughs> omnibus, it was merely a down payment of what is required. H.R. 5011 would help provide the states with the appropriate level of funding. Today's other witness, Rhode Island Secretary of State Nellie Gorbe, participated in one of our task force uh, forums in October. She provided important insight into the resources the federal government was making available to states, the resources states need to secure election infrastructure, and proactive activities she was undertaking at the state level to improve <coughs> election security. I'm glad that the Secretary is here with us today, and again, I look forward to her and Under Secretary Krebs' testimony. Securing our elections is part and parcel to securing our democracy. With that, Mr. Chair, I yield back. Uh, ranking member yields back. <clears throat> Other members of the committee are reminded that opening statements may be submitted for the record. And uh, just for the record, we had the secretary testify before this committee, uh, was openly available on this topic. We had a classified briefing for all House members on election security. Uh, <clears throat> we've been waiting for Under Secretary Krebs to get confirmed by the Senate, and, we're, and sir, uh, let me just congratulate you on your confirmation by the United States Senate, um, and we're fortunate now to have you here today to, to talk about this issue. Um, I also think that the administration is going to be well served by you, sir, and they're lucky to have you. Um, on June 15, 2018, Chris Krebs was sworn in as the Undersecretary for the Department of Homeland Security's National Protection and Programs Directorate after being confirmed by the Senate by a voice vote. As Undersecretary, Mr. Krebs oversees MPPD's efforts to defend civilian networks, secure federal facilities, manage system systemic risk to national critical functions, and work with stakeholders to raise the security baseline of the nation's cyber and physical infrastructure. This is his second tour working at DHS, previously serving as a senior advisor to the Assistant Secretary for infra Infrastructure Protection and playing a formative role in a number of national and international risk management programs. I appreciate your leadership in both the private uh, and the public sector, sir. Thank you for being here. I now would, would like to yield to uh, Mr. Longevin from Rhode Island to introduce the Rhode Island Secretary of State. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you and Ranking Member Thompson for uh, reaching out to me to uh, facilitate inviting uh, Rhode Island Secretary of State uh, Nelga Berry here to the committee. Uh, for, to hear her testimony and the progress she's made in securing election, Rhode Island's election systems. And uh, before I introduce uh, Secretary Gobey, I just want to take a moment to uh, publicly congratulate uh, uh, Secretary Krebs on his uh, finally uh, being confirmed uh, officially. Uh, we had a brief conversation, and uh, I want to 
publicly again congratulate you, Secretary. I appreciate the ongoing relationship and work that you and I have done together and, and uh, discussions we've had on election and cybersecurity, in particular election security. I hope that dialogue can continue in our, our working together. Um, but uh, Mr. Chairman uh, and Ranking Member Thompson, very <coughs> proud today to be honored uh, to be able to rec recognize and uh, welcome uh, Nellie Gobert, Rhode Island Secretary of State, uh, to the panel uh, today. Uh, Secretary Gobert has helped position the Ocean State as a leader in election security. Under her direction, Rhode Island replaced all of its two decades old voting equipment prior to the 2016 election uh, with, uh, with new paper ballot systems. Uh, following the 2016 elections, Secretary Gobea uh, has taken all the steps that we need, uh, that we would hope uh, for states to, uh, to take to better secure their, uh, their elections <coughs> systems. She has emphasized proper IT staffing and training, solicited help from the Election Assistance Commission uh, and from DHS, and proactively exchange information with peers through the multi-state uh, ISAC, Elections Infrastructure ISAC, and the National Association of Secretaries of State. Now, with the help of federal grants appropriated by this Congress, Secretary Gobea is directing the overhaul of Rhode Island's voter registration database, initiating local level grants to increase security, and implementing the country's second mandatory post-election uh, risk limiting audit process. Just as importantly, Secretary Gobea has implemented reforms to increase voter access to the polls in Rhode Island, including online and automated voter registration. Secretary Gobea, thank you for, uh, for making the trip down from Rhode Island uh, to be here today uh, with us, and uh, thank you for your ongoing efforts to expand Rhode Island's access to the polls and to prevent foreign adversaries' access to the same. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, this is a position that I once held as Rhode Island Secretary of State. I am very proud and grateful for the leadership that Secretary Gobea has continued to uh, provide and has certainly exceeded even things that I've accomplished when I was there and very proud of what she has done. And uh, I hope you and all of our colleagues take the opportunity to ask Secretary about her successes uh, and uh, <coughs> how Rhode Island's uh, leadership can be a model for other states to follow. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. With that, I yield back. Gentlemen, yields back. Thank you both for being here today. Your full written statements will appear in the record. The chair now recognizes Under Secretary Cruds for an opening statement. Chairman McCall, Ranking Member Thompson, and members of the committee, thank you for today's opportunity to testify regarding the Department of Homeland Security's ongoing efforts to assist state and local election officials, those who own and operate election systems, while, uh, with improving the resilience of election security across America. Today's hearing is timely as primary elections are generally complete. Election officials now have some time to reflect and get ready for the November midterm elections. In fact, later this week, our leadership team at DHS will meet with election officials as they gather in Philadelphia for their national summer conference. It's not lost on me that we will discuss defending our democratic institutions in the very cradle of democracy, the city that birthed this great nation. The 2018 midterms remain a potential target for Russian actors but the intelligence community has yet to see any evidence of a robust campaign aimed at tampering with our election infrastructure along the lines of 2016 or influencing the makeup of the House or Senate races. The inte intelligence community, however, continues to see Russia using social media flag, uh, false flag personas, sympathetic spokesmen, and other means to influence or inflame positions on opposite ends of controversial issues. These efforts appear to be more focused on dividing rather than targeting specific politicians or political candidates. Nonetheless, we remain vigilant and any attempt to undermine our democracy will be met with consequences. In the meantime, we will continue to work with our election partners to strengthen the resilience of our election systems. As I've traveled across the country during primary season, it's clear to me that secretaries of state and other election officials are not sitting back. They take cybersecurity and security in general seriously. Our mission at DHS is to help our stakeholders better understand and manage the risks they face. Through concerted efforts, in part by building relationships, establishing trust, and understanding what it is that our stakeholders need to manage their risks, we have made significant progress over the last year and a half. Working with state and local election officials, as well as with private sector partners who support them, we have created government and private sector councils who collaboratively work to share information promote best practices, and develop strategies to reduce risk to the nation's election systems. We've also created the Election Infrastructure Information Sharing and Analysis Center, or ISAC, 
made up of over 1,000 members in just under five months, including all 50 states. We're also sponsoring security clearances for multiple election officials in each state. We've increased the availability and deployment of free technical services. We've also offered cybersecurity and physical security training and exercises, and later this summer, we'll have a three-day tabletop exercise uh, with all states involved. Our suite of services will continue to mature as the requirements identified by our election stakeholders mature. We understand that the only way to deliver a resilient election system is to work collaboratively with those, election, with those officials on the front lines running the process. Our work to secure election officials, uh, I'm sorry, to secure election infrastructure is part of my directorate's broader mission to secure all of our nation's critical infrastructure. We are responsible for coordinating the overall federal effort to promote the security and resilience of the nation's critical infrastructure. As we conf uh, confront threats posed by a range of capable adversaries, DHS remains focused on ensuring national unity of effort. It is critical that we combine the unique uh, expertise of the intelligence community, law enforcement, sector-specific agencies, and others to provide an integrated approach to risk management across our nation's critical infrastructure. Rarely is a cyber event sector-specific. Our adversaries target systems that are cross-sector, and the growing interdependencies across sectors demand this integrated approach. Accordingly, DHS serves as an information and operations integrator focused on delivering cross-sector, public-private risk management strategies to enhance the resilience of our nation's infrastructure. Before I conclude, I'd like to take a moment to thank Congress, and this committee in particular, for legislative th progress thus far in strengthening DHS's cybersecurity and cri uh, critical infrastructure authorities. Specifically, we strongly support final passage of legislation to create the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, CISA, at DHS, which would rename and reorganize the National Protection and Programs Directorate. This change reflects the important work we carry out every day to safeguard and secure our critical infrastructure. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Uh, thank you, Under Secretary, and I look forward to working with you to make sure the Senate passes this. I think it's important not only to protecting all 16 critical infrastructures, but also our election system. Uh, Chair now recognizes the Secretary of State, uh, Corbea, for an opening statement. Good morning. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you for all Your microphone. Good morning, and thank you, Chairman McCall, Ranking Member Thompson, and members of the committee for the invitation to participate in this important discussion. I commend your committee for holding this hearing to learn more about what's being done at the federal, state, and local levels to protect our nation's election systems and what can be done to improve upon uh, this work. Advances in technology have brought with them a paradigm shift in elections administration. Cybersecurity is at the forefront of elections conversations taking place right now at every level of government across the country. But before I continue, I want to recognize and thank Congressman Jim Langevin for his visionary leadership in elections administration and his past service as Rhode Island's Secretary of State and whose uh, shoulders I definitely stand on as I do the work I do today. Today, Rhode Island and almost all other states face new challenges that can be summarized as follows. First, Although this is not currently the case in Rhode Island, many elections across our country are being run on equipment that is either obsolete or near the end of its useful life. Second, our public sector employees and systems at the state, county, and municipal levels are ill-prepared to handle the looming threats of cyber attacks. Finally, our country is facing a very real threat by foreign actors and others looking to erode the public's trust in the integrity of our elections. These attacks are real and are focused on undermining our representative democracy. On behalf of my colleagues who oversee elections across the country, I do want to thank you for the $380 million in additional Help America Vote Act funds. However, the challenges our democracy faces today require an ongoing commitment of funding so election officials can prepare for threats that were non-existent five years ago. As these threats evolve, Funding, training, and improved communications are critical to protecting our democracy. This funding should be flexible. After all, actions addressing this new landscape of elections and cybersecurity have taken place in a variety of ways because elections are organized and run differently in every state. 
Having said that, I do believe that our efforts in Rhode Island over the past three years offer valuable insight into the challenges and opportunities that election officials face in this area of increased cyber threats. So, well, how has Rhode Island handled these three challenges I described? First, we replaced outdated voting equipment, which was on the brink of failure. We invested nearly $10 million in new paper-based elections equipment that has four layers of security and encryption. Federal assistance was important throughout all of this process. The Election Assistance Commission helped us, for example, with the RFPs for that equipment. And while modernizing the electoral process and infrastructure, we also leveraged resources offered by the Department of Homeland Security under the critical infrastructure designation. We further protected our central voter registration system. For example, recently the Department of Homeland Security performed external penetration testing and vulnerability scanning to assess any cybersecurity concerns with regards to our voter registration system. This risk and vulnerability assessment provided my office with areas that needed to be improved upon to ensure our system is as secure as possible. We also looked to the Rhode Island National Guard to provide us with a security analysis of newly purchased electronic poll books during a recent special election. Our second challenge is one of building the capacity of the public sector to manage and respond to cyber threats and in our elections. Some of those services can be outsourced. However, uh, we need to make sure that government owns the ability to protect our democracy. In Rhode Island, I have increased my office's IT staff by 40% to make sure that we have the technical expertise in-house to respond to every shifting landscape of cybersecurity. Our work recently received additional help from the federal level. Working with the National Association of Secretaries of State, the Department of Homeland Security provided, um, uh, re initiated a process pr uh, providing uh, chief state election officials like myself with the required security clearance, and this has been really helpful. Uh, at this time, I do want to also add my congratulations to Undersecretary Krebs uh, for his appointment. And I also want to recognize uh, and, uh, the hire at DHS of former Election Assistance Commissioner Chairman Matt Masterson. I believe that really strengthens uh, the operations and the ability of DHS to work with the states on cybersecurity and elections. But building the strength of our election system at the state level addresses only part of what is needed. Local election officials are literally on the front lines and must have the information and resources necessary to identify and mitigate uh, emerging threats. For this reason, in Rhode Island, we uh, are members of the Election Infrastructure Information Sharing and Analysis Center, the EISAC. Soon, all cities and towns in Rhode Island will be signed up with EISAC, which provides election officials with cybersecurity resources, as well as best practices that enhance the overall strength of election systems. As cyber threats continue to evolve and become more sophisticated, states need additional funding and resources dedicated to the security of election. These funds have been uh, critically needed for strengthening the IT capacity within government, developing testing procedures, and undergoing third-party assessments. Our uh, amount uh, of $3 million is being used to invest in our central voter registration database, uh, strengthening of that system, and as well as protecting it. And another large portion is going to help us develop our first ever post-election audit systems in Rhode Island. And finally, keeping in mind what I said about local government, we are going to be using part of the $3 million to initiate an election assistance, uh, elections administration improvement grant program for cities and towns. In conclusion, I want to make the following suggestions. First, Congress should provide ongoing funding to the states so that we remain prepared to face any cybersecurity challenge. Second, federal agencies must continue to provide information, training, and resources to support the work being done to protect our election systems on a state, county, and local level. Congress can help us by formalizing clear communication channels between the levels of government so that we know what to expect in the communication of cybersecurity. Finally, Congress must also continue to provide active oversight in this area that now recognizes the new balance that must be struck between the secrecy required for security measures needed to safeguard our democracy, at the same time as we balance it with the transparency and access to information that ensure an open government. Thank you very much for the opportunity to share my thoughts with you on this and my experiences as Rhode Island's Secretary of State. I look forward to continuing our conversation. Thank you, Secretary. I now recognize myself for five minutes of questioning. Um, in October 2016, the ranking member and I sat in what's called a 
gang of, of eight briefing with the uh, DNI uh, Director Clapper and Secretary of Homeland Security Jay Johnson. <clears throat> we were briefed uh, at that time in a classified setting since then the information has been made public that Russia was attempting to meddle in our elections using a, a, a campaign information warfare uh, model. Um, I would I have to say it was very disturbing. I think I speak for the ranking member as well. Um, I urged then at that time that, that the previous administration to call out Russia for what they were doing and that there should be consequences to their actions. I've also said the same thing to this administration, that Russia needs to be called out and there should be consequences. Congress uh, passed sanctions, harsh sanctions against Russia for their conduct. Uh, with that, Mr. Krebs, I want to ask you, <clears throat> if you, as we move into the 2016 mid, or 2018 midterm elections, can you tell me what the threat level is from foreign adversaries and foreign nation states um, to p potentially meddle in the upcoming elections? So as I uh, mentioned in my opening statement, we have not seen anything, certainly to the degree of 2016, in terms of specific hacking of election systems. And I think at this point, it is, it's important to, to distinguish or differentiate between directed technical attacks against IT systems, much like what we saw in 2016 with uh, the, the database, the voter registration database, bases, the scanning. That is the cybersecurity technical piece of it. And then there's also an information operations element of it. And I think that's fairly well characterized in the uh, intelligence community assessment. Uh, we, we are, again, not seeing on either hand something that rises to anything that rises from uh, to the level of 2016 directed, focused, robust campaign. But we do see continued Russian activities. The intelligence community continues to see Russian activity in the sowing discord across the American public. And it's not, again, directed necessarily at politicians uh, or political campaigns, but it is focused on identifying divisive issues and sowing discord and creating chaos and, frankly, undermining democracy. So there'd be, <clears throat> be more of this campaign information or disinformation warfare. I, yes, sir. That's the way I'd characterize it. We're seeing more along the lines of information operations uh, rather than directed technical attacks or anything focusing on elections, or particularly the midterms. So that, that leads me to the, the vulnerabilities in the election system itself. Uh, you don't see any targeted technical attacks towards, say, the voting machines? Uh, in terms of the, well, to stepping back a little bit on the voting machines, and I, you know, of course would defer to Secretary Gorbea on what she has seen in Rhode Island. Uh, we're, the voting systems in and of themselves are systems of systems. So we have uh, the, the voting day, which is what people typically think of with e-poll books and the optical scanning machines or the DREs. Uh, and then you have a broader system that supports uh, the back end, the information management systems that, uh, uh, store voter registration. Just like any IT system, there, there are going to be vulnerabilities just by the very nature of it. There are a series of compensating controls, uh, even on DREs, that can limit risk. And, and ultimately, what we're looking for here is not a 100% secure system. Just like any IT system, there is no such thing as a secure IT system. What we're looking for is resilience in the system. And to, to think about this maybe in a, in a different way is uh, over the course of the last couple months through uh, primaries, there have been a number of issues with IT systems. And California had a, a, a voter uh, printout, uh, uh, about 118,000 voters across, across 1,000 precincts in LA County. And then just recently in Maryland, there was an uh, issue with transferring registration information from the uh, DMV to uh, the Secretary of State, uh, State's office. And what we're really seeing there more than anything is that, yes, there are technical challenges, but the way the system is engineered or architected, in, in part due to work by Congress, uh, and HAVA in particular, is that even if you showed up to vote and your registration had been whether accidentally or intentionally deleted from a voter registration file, you have the ability to request a provisional ballot. So if in 2016, when the Russians were in the Illinois state registration database, had they deleted voter registration files, Illinois citizens would have been able to show up. If their information had been deleted, they still would have been able to request a provisional ballot. They would have cast their ballot. It would have been counted as cast. So this, again, 
It's not 100% security. We are looking to achieve resilience in the system. Uh, Secretary, how resilient uh, do you uh, believe the, your state system is? Our system is actually very resilient, and I, and I share under Secretary uh, Krebs' uh, description of, of what we're looking for is resilience and not foolproof uh, security. Uh, and so we have a series of uh, mitigating factors. One is, of course, protecting the systems. Um, each uh, uh, city and town has its own structures of, of how to then transfer that information to, um, to the central. But, but what Undersecretary Krebs described is very much what's happening in Rhode Island today. And in addition, we've been able to leverage resources, not just from the federal level, but for our own National Guard, so that we're constantly testing the security of systems at the same time as we sort of think of the what if. Uh, what if something happens? Uh, so, for example, recently we had a, um, a, a um, mock uh, disaster day with all of the clerks and, and the cities and towns to try to go through what happens if you show up on election day and you discover that there has been some tampering. How, what, how would you respond? We hadn't done that before this year mm -hmm. because it hadn't really come up. And so you have to get people at the local and municipal level to start thinking uh, in this way, uh, which goes to my, my point time, about... My time's kind of expired. Oh, sorry. Expired, but I, let me just say... Uh, uh, in terms of the voting machines themselves, most of them, these machines are not connected to the internet now. They're disconnected. So, so the description of whether or not they're connected um, is an interesting one uh, because that also has changed over time. Most machines are individual and there is a modem transmission for some of them, for example, at the end of the day that transmits the results. Uh, but there are backups to that. And, and in the case of Rhode Island, the most important backup, of course, is the paper ballot. But everything's always threat-based, going back to the premise of my question. Mm -hmm. You don't see this technical threat currently. In terms of the voting systems in Rhode Island, no. From um, foreign adversaries. From, from foreign adversaries, no. Yeah. I do think that, that I mean, we front-loaded our investment into, into voting machines, and that made a big difference in our and being Undersecretary, to... uh, you and I talked previously about members of Congress. Mm -hmm. um, how, how safe are we from foreign adversary attacks, and how, how protected are we on our networks? So every, everyone has a different threat model. Uh, I think given the sensitivity of the information, the policy shaping that this body uh, engages in, I think that it's safe to say that a foreign adversary from a pure intelligence perspective would probably want to know what you guys are doing on a daily basis, what policies you're driving. Uh, uh, in terms of how you're positioned from a security perspective, I don't have frankly, in-depth knowledge of your IT systems given the uh, separation of powers, but happy to provide a uh, briefing on, in part, best practices, but also work with the CIO. I think we're doing some uh, engagement on how we can collaborate and, and help help Congress uh, secure their network. I, I think that would be helpful. I think most members have no idea how vulnerable they really are uh, to these attacks. So with that, I, I, I recognize the ranking member. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you because we've been in some hearings, uh, some briefings who uh, really laid out some kind of scary scenarios. Uh, well, you, you're you official now, Mr. Krebs, welcome. Uh, just from a historical standpoint, uh, how many states uh, have we identified uh, that the Russians uh, did some form of uh, intrusion in the last elections. So when we think back to 2016, there are a couple ways we have to kind of hash out the information. And it's all based on, frankly, awareness, visibility into activity and infrastructure. So we've thrown around numbers, uh, 18 were either uh, accessed or scanned or targeted or 21, whatever it is. Last summer we, we gave 21. When I That number of 21 that were scanned, that information is based on the telemetry, the, the, in, the visibility into traffic uh, over networks that we, that we had, vis frankly, that we had visibility to last year. If you were to ask me what I really thought happened, I would suspect, and Jeanette, uh, Assistant Secretary Manfred said this, I believe Secretary Nielsen said this too, I, I would suspect that the Russians probably scanned all 50 states and five territories and the District of Columbia. Scanning, it happens every day. It's an automated process. 
I just, uh, I, again, I think based on the 21 number, that's on what we were able to see. We have better visibility going into 18. We uh, basically have, will have access uh, to close to 50% of visibility, I'm sorry, 100% visibility into at least the state networks. So is that scanning considered a vulnerability? The scanning is, is, a, uh, is a threat. A vulnerability would reside in the system. Uh, the scanning is the actual foreign adversary's actions uh, so, to look for vulnerabilities. So since, whether it's 18, 21, whatever, mm -hmm. how many states have we uh, worked with to identify, uh, help them identify potential threats or, or whatever? So at this point, sir, we are working with all 50 states. We have all 50 states as members of the Election Infrastructure Information Sharing and Analysis Center. Uh, that is uh, since February when we stood up the ISAC. Uh, a th uh, close to 1,000 total members of the ISAC at this point. And that's 50 states plus local jurisdictions, counties, uh, and associations like NAS and NASA. Yeah. So your testimony is that everybody's cooperating. There are levels of cooperation, as always. Everybody has different capabilities at the state level and different resourcing as well. But at this moment, I can say that all 50 states are participating in the ISAC. Explain resourcing. Uh, sir, resourcing would be how they're funded at the state level. Um, you know, uh, Secretary Gorbeo was fortunate to have resources from, uh, provided by the state treasury that she could in 2016 uh, or prior to 2016, uh, replace her uh, outdated equipment. Not all states are similarly resourced, uh, and that is going to be a challenge uh, going forward. And, and I think that is probably the, the greatest opportunity for policy discussion in, uh, Madam in this Madam Secretary, body. you've talked to some of your colleagues around the country, mm -hmm. I'm sure, on this. Can you uh, shed a little light on the resourcing? Yeah, I can absolutely vouch for the fact that the equipment is just the tip of the iceberg. It's the one that's easy to fix quickly, right? because you know that it's outdated, you know that it's not up to code, and you can replace it and come in. I think the second layer of resourcing that's really important is the public sector rank and file people who are working in this in government. And we at some point need to invest in making sure that the people at the local level, you can have fabulous resources at the federal level at DHS, but if they don't have anyone to engage with at the local level on the security and what all of this means, then you're basically going blind. So um, I think that there's, it's two pieces. One is the equipment, and the other one's the human resources. So, so uh, we talked a little bit about this re-siloing uh, mm -hmm. that's occurring. Um, give us your opinion about how you see that uh, uh, pro or con uh, in terms of the cyber, uh, Mr. Undersecretary. So I thank you for the question. I think this one's pretty clear. The Homeland Security Act 2003 provided the Secretary of Homeland Security very clear authorities to lead uh, the critical infrastructure protection activities of the, across the federal government uh, in coordination with sector-specific agencies, the intelligence community, and law enforcement. So I think to the extent that, that we are creating duplicative, uh, whether it's liability protections or information sharing or information uh, uh, integration centers, I think that is having a net negative effect. It's in, in some cases it could put us into uh, something along the lines of a, of a pre-9-11 uh, position where we don't have that integration. That's why in my opening statement I said several times the DHS is an, integrate, is an information and operations integrator. That is our role. Right. So uh, in other words, it, it will make us less secure. Uh, that is my belief, yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, gentleman yields back. A gentleman from New York, Mr. King, is recognized. Hey, Mr. Chairman, we uh, thank both witnesses for testifying here today, and Secretary Krebs, wish you the very best. And Secretary Govan, thank you for your efforts in Rhode Island and for working with my good friend, Mr. Langerman. Uh, when we talk about cyber activity by the Russians, you know, today we seem to be focusing, obviously, on the uh, uh, attempts to hack the election systems, but also they distorted information, attempted to influence people. What is being done in that, and who has primary jurisdiction over that? So, uh, as I said earlier on, you know, we do look at things at the technical hacking and then the information operations. DHS has a lead for supporting state and local governments in the information, or I'm sorry, in that in the 
hacking space. Uh, FBI has lead in the countering foreign interference in the, in the information operations space. DHS does support the FBI's efforts, uh, as does, of course, the intelligence community. It, yeah. Do you want to add to that? No, I okay. mean, they, they really do have the, uh, the best information on, particularly the information warfare stuff. Right. And How is the level of cooperation with the FBI and DHS on that? So most recently, uh, we did have a meeting in February um, with the Office of the Director of, of National Intelligence, the FBI, and Department of Homeland Security that was incredibly helpful to secretaries of state across the country that were all together for their annual meeting. Um, that kind of information is, is critical. We can't, part of the challenge here with elections is elections are decentralized. So, and I think we, we suffered some, you know, beginning stumbling, you know, when all of this came together, uh, where it, a locality was being informed of a potential breach or, or activities, and the chief state election official, who happened to be Secretary of State, didn't know about it. Now, those, those thing, communication activities between the federal and the local and the state level, I think, have smoothed out considerably over the last several months as we learn to get along. Uh, the other challenge is, that as elected officials, we deal in the world of transparency and open government. Right. And DHS works in a very different mode. And that's a tension that we need to be conscious of and to make sure that we, make, we, we accept the adequate provisions for. Now, we also know that Russia is interfering in elections throughout Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, more elections coming up, more uh, meddling expected. How much information does DHS share with our foreign allies or foreign countries on this, and how closely do we work with them? I, it's difficult to quantify how much information we share, but I do know that uh, over the last year or so with various uh, campaigns that have happened in Europe, whether it was France or Germany, we do have cert to cert relationships where we can share technical indicators of uh, known command and control infrastructure of Russian adversaries, so we can help them you know, we'll share what we know, they'll share what they know. Uh, so it, I do feel as if it's a, uh, um, it's, a, it's a good relationship in terms of the, the engagement. And as far as Rhode Island, now you may have covered this in your opening statement, but uh, how much cooperation is there among the states as far as, you know, you sitting down with other secretaries of state? And so the National Association of Secretaries of State provides an excellent coming together uh, on a bipartisan basis. Uh, so that we can have these conversations about what's happening. Uh, we've also, under that uh, advocacy or, or, or not group, bipartisan group, have provided a space for our own IT officials, uh, our rank and file civil servants, to be able to have conversations around security issues and what are best practices. And those are critically important in this day and age. Without having to name names, are you like other secretaries of state who resist this, who feel that this? <laughs> Why is over, over, uh, this, uh, you know, your threat is overblown? No, I, I don't think that anybody at this point, well, for the most part, I think everybody agrees that there is some level of threat. I think that was made very clear um, in, our, in our security briefing afternoon. Um, there, there are more tensions around this issue of the communications with the federal government and, and where, um, and how do we go about finding out what's happening in our own states so that we can help proactively mm -hmm. uh, address the issues at a local level. Mm -hmm. Secretary, you want to add anything to that? Or? I, I think that's spot on. As I mentioned in my opening, uh, everyone understands that the threat is real. Uh, the challenge here is, is, again, goes to the resourcing issue of I, if I provide information, what can be done about it? Mm -hmm. To the point of um, the classified information and how we engage. I aim on a daily basis to operate as much in the unclassified space as possible so that the products that I push out are immediately actionable by a broad community. So it doesn't help me if I'm, as, as Secretary Gorbea pointed out, if I'm, in, if I'm living in a classified space. That should not be the DHS mission space. We should be managing risk in an unclassified manner that's informed by threat intelligence. Secretary Krebs, Secretary Gobey, thank you very much. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman yields, uh, the gentleman from Rhode Island, Mr. Longevin, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, um, and thank you, Recording Member Thompson, and to uh, Secretary Krebs and Secretary Gobey, thank you again for your testimony and all the work that you're doing to, uh, uh, to enhance election security uh, across, the, uh, across the country. 
Mr. Krebs, let me start with you. Um, as you know, the 2018 omnibus provided uh, additional HAVA uh, funding for state election officials to better secure their systems in advance of the midterms. Uh, do you believe that, uh, that the states are using these federal dollars, the, the states using these federal dollars are making risk informed decisions uh, on how uh, to spend them? So I do believe that states are using the money in a, in a manner uh, that addresses their threat model, their risks uh, scenario. The, uh, I would not, though, assume that all that money is going to replace out-of-date equipment. It, it, there are challenges from a per procurement perspective. There's also the challenge for it's frankly not enough money to transition that equipment. What we've done working with states in, informed in part by our risk and vulnerability assessments is working with DHS, working with the EAC, and with the Government Coordinating Council, uh, put together a, a list of recommended expenditures. So if you've got this money from the omnibus, the $380 million, your distribution, here are good ways to spend it. And there are things uh, as simple as um, uh, hiring a, uh, what we're calling a cyber navigator, someone that, that actually has cybersecurity expertise that can get out from your state capital and go work with uh, the various counties. Because that's the real challenge here. Is that when we think about across the nation, there's close to, if not over, 10,000 jurisdictions. Yeah. And there's not enough cybersecurity expertise to go around uh, as it stands. So let's, let's continue to invest in that. But it's also things like training, uh, exercises, response planning, uh, patching systems, uh, uh, updating operating systems, things like that. So the list you mentioned certainly is helpful, but that's broad. It's not specific to, uh, to, to their systems per se. I guess my, what I would ask, would requirements that states conduct uh, risk uh, assessments before using the federal dollars uh, help to ensure uh, maximum uh, uh, efficacy uh, to improve their cybersecurity posture? So I think that that is certainly uh, something that we would consider. And we, we uh, of course, offer the risk and vulnerability assessments to uh, to the states. At this point, we've conducted uh, about 17 of them. We have another one that's in the process. But absent the other uh, 31 being completed or 32 being completed, we're taking the lessons learned, the observations from those risk and vulnerability assessments, and we're sharing those broadly through the ISAC and through our day-to-day -day engagement. So for those states that don't, haven't done an RVA, may not want to do an RVA because they have some other capability, we're going ahead and taking the learnings that we got from the RVA uh, that Rhode Island did, and we're pushing that out more broadly. Again, that's what informed the recommended expenditures or the guidance uh, that we developed with the GCC. So that is a, a good way of, and, and to be clear, that through all of those risk and vulnerability assist, ass, uh, assessments, we saw pretty much the same thing. Out-of-date operating systems, patch management challenges, uh, and uh, lack of awareness across staff. And these are all things that we can address through, initially through the, the HAVA money, but then ongoing DHS support. Thank you. I think that some of those things are very helpful. I, I think that the um, uh, requirements for risk assessments I think would be the best way to use the funds. Uh, and I'll, I'll mention that uh, I want to point out to the chairman uh, that uh, the Bipartisan Paper Act that I've introduced with Congressman Mark Meadows uh, uh, contains provisions that will require uh, these kinds of, of assessment. So, um, but Secretary Gaber, um, in your testimony, uh, you spoke about the need for continued cybersecurity training of state mm -hmm. and local election officials. So can you elaborate on the, the nature of the, the training that's needed, uh, and in particular about the, uh, the resources you hope DHS can provide. Yeah, um, yeah. So basically, we're only as strong as our weakest link. And and while I have been able to really um, uh, improve the the cybersecurity in, our, 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 in in the Department of State, truth is is that elections in Rhode Island are run also at the local boards of canvassers as well as the the state uh, board of elections. So what we've Im encountered is once you deal with a hardware issue, you have to deal with the people as well. Uh, DHS has been particularly helpful um, in, in helping us navigate through all of that. I also want to give a shout out though to the Election Assistance Commission because when we were looking for new voting equipment, they were there to help us also with best practices. And I think that is a perfect role for the federal government with locals. The locals know, the state 
people know where their needs are most pressing. Uh, the training that we've done in Rhode Island involves everything from a cyber summit that uh, you participated in about a year ago, uh, where we, where we basically walk through why are we having these conversations around cybersecurity. For somebody who's a clerk who's handling everything from phishing licenses to, license, to other types of licenses to voter registration, it may not be clear to them why they need to be you know, safeguarding the password for the central voter registration system when they're, in, when they're doing you know, voter registrations. <coughs> um, so we had a big conversation with the local officials in which we will continuously do every six months and as part of every single training that we do out of the Department of State to help build that capacity at the local level. Thank you very much. I know that uh, my, my time expired. I want to thank you both for your testimony. Um, and Mr. Chairman, I know um, since my time expired, I'll, I'd like to submit this question for the record. Uh, on April 24th, uh, Assistant Secretary Jeanette Manfred testified that the, the surge in risk and vulnerability assessments for election infrastructure created a significant backlog in other critical infrastructure sectors and federal agencies waiting for similar assessments. Uh, the President's 2019 budget did not request an increase in resources sufficient to overcome this backlog. So my question would be, are, are more resources necessary to support the increased requests from state and local governments without delaying uh, other assessments, uh, or do you expect uh, RVA backlogs to be uh, the new normal at NPPD? Uh, I'll submit that for the record since my time's expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. G gentleman yields uh, the gentleman from Alabama. Mr. Rogers is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Secretary Cribbs, uh, I've been surprised that so many Americans have acted shocked that Russia was meddling in our election when they've been meddling in elections all across the globe uh, in countries, particularly European countries and most specifically Eastern European countries that used to be a part of the USSR. And they do this uh, primarily through disinformation. Uh, many people in America may not realize that RT is Russia today and it's a propaganda tool. Uh, my question is, since disinformation is their tool of choice or their weapon of choice in meddling in elections uh, across the globe, do you have somebody in your department or is it your department's job to counter this disinformation when you find it in our country? And if not, what department does have that responsibility? So as I, as I mentioned earlier, the way we look at it, again, is the technical hacking piece, and then there's the information operations. DHS leads the cybersecurity, working with state and local. FBI leads information operations, but DHS does support. So FBI's role working with the intelligence community is identifying specific actors, whether it's Twitter handles or whatever it is, and disrupting those activities. Now, that's only part of the problem, is actually taking down the uh, the disruptive activity because frankly with disinformation the way to counter disinformation is actually shine light on the activity so what we are doing at DHS working with others uh, in uh, the State Department Global Engagement Center working with the FBI uh, is to build a greater understanding and awareness of what their activities are engaging social media companies engaging traditional media in sharing our findings, our trends, here are the things that they're doing, how do we raise awareness across uh, the American public? And this is one of those cases that um, it's, it's different from traditional cybersecurity because cybersecurity elections, for instance, what we are aiming for is resilience in the system. So we can take a lick and we can keep going forward. Disinformation is completely different. It's, the, the objective is, is anti-fragility. And what that means is, unlike resilience, where you just want to keep moving through it, with anti-fragility, you want to come back stronger, where you learned from the experience or that engagement, what we learned in 2016, that we learned and we closed out that avenue of influence. That's where we're aiming for. So we are doing a good bit of trend analysis of how we're seeing Russian actors engage uh, through information campaigns. Uh, in, in operations and looking for opportunities of intervention to close out those those avenues. So when you say we, are you talking about just DHS? Or? No, sir. It, it is a it's a it's a, uh, a cross government agency. I uh, in my operation in, in PPD working with the Intelli uh, intelligence analysis directorate, the privacy office, the civil rights and civil liberties office at DHS, among others, we've established a countering foreign influence task force. Uh, and they, we are looking at um, some of the, the unique authorities the department has. That works in uh, 
coordination with the FBI's Foreign Influence Task Force. It's also supported by uh, the intelligence community and the State Department. So it is everybody has a um, uh, a role in this, given the unique authorities uh, uh, in the uh, well, frankly, the the unique authorities of the various agencies. Excellent, so, uh, Secretary Gobea. Uh, you talked about replacing all of your boating machines mm -hmm. in the state. How much did it cost to do that? Uh, $10 million. And how much of that was state money? All of it. All of it was state money, no yes. federal money was used? No federal money was used. Have you received any federal money for any uh, security improvements? Yes. I mean, well, we'll, we'll, we will be using the $3 million HAVA funds uh, to continue now to really tackle our central voter registration system, which was developed with actually the first batch of HAVA monies uh, and so uh, that application will be rewritten and strengthened. Yeah, and you mentioned earlier in your opening statement that you needed to make some improvements to your central database. Mm -hmm. What exactly are you talking about? So just protecting further protections. Uh, you know, our, our, the focus of our risk vulnerability assessment was actually our central voter registration database to make sure that we didn't know of open doors throughout our systems that m somebody might come in through. So that Is it connected to a network? As, uh, yes. And, and actually, I must say, we actually now have trained all of our staff and continue to do ongoing training to every, whether you're in the archives of the Secretary of State's office or in business services as to identify phishing, emails, things like that, so everybody's on their toes to not click on something that might compromise our elections. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you all for being here. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Uh, the gentleman from New Jersey, Ms. Watson Coleman, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Congratulations to you, uh, Mr. Krebs, um, and thank you for being here, Madam Secretary. I just, I've got a couple of questions. Um, is it possible that Russia could be doing something right now um, that would interfere with this, with this 2018 election that we might not know about yet? Could they possibly be involved some way now, or is it just too early? You know, again, like I mentioned, we haven't seen anything, certainly on the level of 2016, either on the direct hacking. We do know that they are launching, or they are carrying out, generally speaking, information operations. Uh, you know, I, this is kind of one of those, you know, I don't know what I don't know right now. How many, how many months in advance was this hacking identified before the 2016? Was it three months before, two months before, five months before? That uh, that was before my time at the department. I was uh, Would you know, though, private just... sector. I, it was uh, it was over the course of the summer, I believe, prior to the 2000. Okay, so it's really this summer that we need. It was, to uh, you know, I think the real, as I recall, the 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 real indicators of activity took place uh, about this time, July of mm -hmm. of 2016. Okay, um, it's really confusing to me all of the various agencies that are have a piece of this. Mm -hmm. So is there like a routine meeting that you all have around these issues? So in terms of the cybersecurity piece, yes, ma'am. We've developed um, a government coordinating council that brings not just uh, federal agencies together, but also state and local partners. So in that, it's a weekly meeting oh. that DHS, uh, the Election Assistance Commission, but also, you know, I, I'm of the mind that when it's just the federal government working together, uh, on a problem, you're not getting a lot done because the federal government doesn't always have all the answers. We need to work with our stakeholders, again, as I said in my opening statement, to understand what their requirements are so that we can tailor our right. services to address their needs. And that's really the mantra that I've instituted across in PPD. It's, it's requirements-based. Do you think, or even do you think, Madam Secretary, based upon your involvement, that all 50 states are equally concerned, engaged, and willing to participate as rigorously as possible to ensure that our infrastructure, our voting infrastructure is uh, protected and our voters' votes are counted. So I, I cannot speak for all 50 states. I can tell you that at the National Association of Secretaries of State, these issues have been highlighted and discussed uh, more so than I ever thought when I was running for Secretary of State. Well, so like the president still doesn't believe that this has happened because Vladimir Putin has told him that it hasn't. In your um, sort of interactions, are there any states that kind of are where the president is on this, that it really didn't happen, it's crap? 
Or does everyone recognize, I, except for the president, that this did happen? I personally have not had any conversations mm -hmm. that, that can so be characterized that way. $38 million has been um, appropriated to help various states uh, protect their systems or do whatever they have to do. Does that include um, money going down into the municipalities and the counties to train people, to do the audits that need to be done, to um, replace the equipment that needs to be replaced, Mr. So Prince. the 380 million in the FY18 omnibus is a broad, uh, is available for a broad set mm -hmm. of it. But it can it goes to the states, and then the states will decide how to spend it. it I believe it depends. That, on that is the, correct, and it's uh, there's actually a fair there. Uh, while there are guidance in sort of big pu buckets of categories, it's really allow it really allows the the, the chief state election official to allocate it in the best way possible. That so th it's been indicated that the states have suggested a $380 million while a lot of money is not adequate. Do you have any idea what that number should be from their perspective? Not, not offhand, although I can use Rhode Island as an example, for example. So we, we are receiving uh, $3 million. Our replacement alone, right. the voting systems of the machines, was $10 million. And that was purely state money. That's right. So if a state doesn't have it, and this $380 million could be legitimately used for it, um, it seems like it really could be a lot more, depending upon how many states have the capacity to do this and want to do it. Yes, that is correct. Okay, all right. Thank you, thank you, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. General A. Yields, uh, the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Perry, is recognized. Thanks, Mr. Chairman, and, and congratulations, Secretary. And welcome, uh, Madam Secretary, appreciate your presence. I just want to make sure I understand the playing field and in the context that Russia or, or the USSR in its previous version has been involved in the United States and undermining the United States since, since 1917, since the Bolshevik Revolution. I mean, and the history of the Venona transcripts and recepts show that they infiltrated our government at the very, very highest levels and influenced policy in magnificent effect in the decades past, but under, so, so this is nothing new, but, but in the current context, uh, Madam Secretary in particular, do we know of, and, and, and Secretary, if you know, they, their incursion into the most recent federal election, the presidential election, uh, they didn't change any of the votes as far as I know, right? That we're, we're talking about uh, information gathering, and, but I think in the greater sense, they're, we're talking about pro propaganda and influence operations as, a fo as opposed to vote tampering or changing. Am I correct in that assessment? So from the, the extent of our understanding in 2016, that rather the extent of their access was to voter, a voter registration database uh, that was not a vote count, it was well kind of left of voting day. They were able to get into uh, a, a state voter regi uh, registration database and exfiltrate some data. And, and their interest in, in, in looking at the voter database, so to speak, was to then provide propaganda or information to key voters or to target them. I, I'm, not, I, I'm not actually sure that that, that's, uh, that, that was their intent. Uh, in fact, I think to a certain extent, they didn't know necessarily what they were looking at. They were in a certain, to a certain, um, perhaps mucking around in a system, trying to figure out where they had landed and where okay. they were and understand, frankly, how the systems worked and how they interoperated. Uh, but to be clear, we did not see them having access to any machines, equipment, or whatever that was involved in vote or vote tallying. And it's because of the lack of network access and decentralization of the voting system among states that even if they would have wanted to, they figured out where they were and they wanted to influence it, it had been very, very difficult. That, that's my understanding, but I want to clarify that, or have you clarified that's, that? That's certainly a contributing factor, yes, sir. Okay. And so at this point, other than access to voter registration, we don't know exactly what their intent was, and they, they don't at this point admit that they were ever even involved, right? They still don't admit that they were ever involved, but we are fairly confident they, that they were. Is that correct? And the intelligence community assessment from 2017 was pretty clear that they did intend to in interfere. Yes, sir. But we don't know in what way they... In admitted. what way. Okay. I'd, I'd have to go back and do a dig back into the ICA, but... 
Okay, and I think that's important to know to inform us of, of future elections. I, I don't suspect, since they deny uh, currently that they were even involved, that they will ever admit that they're probably going to try and stay involved and continue to be involved as, as they have since, you know, for the last hundred years, essentially, right? They're probably going to, so, so it would be important to know, I would think, to get an assessment of what they were seeking to do if they did, in fact, get in. We, we should know that so we can safeguard in the future, but let's go to the uh, the countering foreign influence task force that you talked about regarding propaganda and disinformation. We've got a, 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 an election coming up in about four months. Will that organization be prepared at that time to inform by whatever method it deci decides and determines is appropriate the American public of things like Russia Today or uh, uh, ads on social media, et cetera, to influence uh, via propaganda, the American electorate. Will they? Will that task force be prepared at that time to in, be engaged? So my, my task force, I wouldn't think of it as an incident response capability. I think of it more of as an analytical cell. To see what the activities they do over time, what their tr what their uh, t tactics, techniques, and procedures are, and build up a body of knowledge to then share, generally speaking, here are the sorts of things they do. These are the sorts of things that the American public should be on the lookout for. Other agencies have the more tactical response of, we are seeing, for instance, the Internet Research Agency perhaps do activity X, Y, or Z. Uh, that is where the FBI becomes involved. That is where other agencies become involved. Okay, so I, I think I have a clear understanding of that, but what I'm missing, and I think some other members might be missing, is once we have that information, once we have that track record, then what? Who is going to inform the American people of this, adverti this advertisement is, is specifically coming from a propaganda source, whether it's Russia or some other uh, hostile nation or adversarial nation, and to be suspicious of it. Whose job in the American, in the federal government or state and local governments is it to do that informing of the citizenry? So this is in part uh, a government industry collaboration. So where we have social media companies working with government, we'll be able to identify the information, whether flag it or take it down, similar to terrorist use of the internet, where they remove content, uh, disable accounts. Uh, that sort of activity can happen on the, the private sector side, on the industry so side. So it's, it's, it's planned to happen solely on the private sector No, sir. It, it is, this is truly a partnership. This is going to be the government will be taking certain actions, and then the uh, private sector uh, will be taking certain actions. I think if you look at what Twitter has done over the last week or so, or, they, or last month, couple months, where they've disabled 70 million accounts by press reports at least, I think that's the sort of activity you can, you'll see happening going forward. Okay. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. I yield. Uh, <clears throat> gentleman yields. Uh, the gentlelady from uh, Florida, Ms. Demings, is recognized. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to both of you for being here with us today. Congratulations, uh, Mr. Undersecretary, and thank you so much for the work that you're doing in Rhode Island as well. Um, let me just say, I uh, we've heard a lot about uh, what happened in 2016 uh, with our election, and and I grew up in Florida, and Florida's the state that kind of keeps everyone up all night, especially on general election night. I just, I think everybody here understands the importance of protecting our systems, but let me just say this. Um, I grew up in Florida. I represent a district in Florida. When I think about my parents, my mother was a maid and my father was a janitor. But I cannot remember a time they did not exercise their right to vote. And I think they were so dedicated because they understood that regardless of the color of their skin or where they lived or how much money they did not have in the bank, that their vote mattered. It counted, and it counted as much as any billionaire or millionaire in this country. So why wouldn't we, especially as one of the most powerful bodies in the world in Congress, want to protect this basic right for every American. So I do thank you for the work that you are doing uh, to further that goal. Um, Undersecretary, I was a little bit surprised as we look at the, I think, the viciousness and consistency of Russia and other foreign par uh, powers that want to attack our, our system that more states had not taken advantage of the full array of resources that DH 
S offers. I know that I believe you said 17 have participated in the risk vulnerability um, assessments. When we think about, uh, number one, I'd like to know what do you think you could do to encourage more states to participate, even though it's a they have the option, the ability to opt in or not. And also for a state uh, like Florida, if they did today call and say they want the uh, vulnerability risk assessment done, how soon uh, could you get that done? So to your first question, what can we do more of? Uh, the, the, we need to continue steady state engagement working through a number of different venues like uh, the National Association of Secretaries of States. They've been a huge partner of amplifying our message. But it's also important to understand that the, the DHS service of the risk and vulnerability assessment is, um, is just one of several options that states have available. We have approached some states. They've said, thank you for the offer, but we have a private sector solution that does exactly that, that's already on contract. So. Uh, I don't ever, frankly, anticipate getting all 50 states in the risk and vulnerability assessment process. I, I suspect we maybe get to 25, maybe 30. That's that's kind of the stretch. Uh, it is, for us, again, it is reaching out, continuing the engagement, continuing the education, and really, frankly, more than anything, it's building a relationship and building and establishing trust. We're still getting, you know, I think for the most part, we've gotten over kind of the trust hump that, that we, uh, the challenge that we had last year. I think we're getting there. So in terms of Florida, or frankly, any state that was to ask for a risk and vulnerability assessment, we've been very clear in how we've communicated to our state partners that as soon as you're ready to do a risk and vulnerability assessment, we'll be there. It, it, th there were discussions uh, last time, I think I testified, about a nine-month backlog. There, there's no nine-month backlog. It's when the state's available to do it, and it's not just show up tomorrow and we'll do a vulnerability assessment. There is, it, there's a little bit of prepar uh, preparation that has to happen, and I'm sure mm -hmm. Secretary Gorbea can share her experience, but th there's preparation that has to happen before we can go in there and do our penetration testing. There are legal agreements that have to be signed. There's, there's scoping of the, the, uh, the networks that, that we have to do. So there, there are a number of preparatory measures that, that do lead to some um, some time buffer before we can actually get in there. Thank you, Secretary. Yes. Yeah, no, I have to say, um, you know, on, on the ground, um, we have found DHS to be actually very responsive. And in fact, one of the first things that they, we were probably one of the first to sign up for the under the critical infrastructure set up. Then the next thing I remember we had, you know, three people showed up at my office and uh, the regional director, a program person, a security person, all introduced themselves in person, which I have to say is probably one of the first times I've seen anybody from the federal government, you know, sort of show up in my office, um, and and introduce themselves to my staff, and so that created a bond in terms of a trust factor because I know who I'm dealing with, and that started our process going, and we did do the risk and vulnerability assessment. Um, what I think then what was interesting is to see the disconnect sort of in a broader basis, uh, as, as information at the very sort of in the classified and intelligence level sort of started to happen, there were some misfires in terms of, you know, you would, they would contact the locality but not the chief state election official. If you're a chief state election official and you're also an elected, you want to know what's going on in your state, of course. And that was, I think, really just, this is all new territory for all of us. We're learning cyber stuff, they're learning election stuff. And, and, and I think one of the really big questions as this evolves is that balance between you know, the security world deals with securing everything down. They don't want to tell, you know, they want to tell as few people as possible. We deal in the world of open government and transparency. We need to be transparent. And going back to the point that was made earlier, people can need to be able to trust their elections. And, and so they do that because we're open and transparent in the way we do things. And that is, I think, at the intersection of where the, the challenge is. How do we secure the elections while not losing the, the democracy in the secrecy of it all? Because I can't tell you what's happening, but just trust me. Well, no, that's not going to work in the elections frame. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. General Lee yields. Uh, General Lee from Arizona. Ms. McSally is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thanks for your testimony today. Uh, look, we know bad actors like Russia have been trying to undermine our way of life. 
uh, our representative government. Uh, since the days I was at the Air Force Academy in the mid 80s, we've been studying their tactics and uh, they evolve over time, but it's still the same uh, intent. I really appreciate the discussion today. I think it's really important. I want to talk about the cybersecurity side of this, not the misinformation side. Um, and one of those states that uh, was uh, hacked was Arizona. Uh, I represent Southern Arizona. Uh, I, we've had a classified briefing on this, uh, but as you talked about it, you want to be in the unclassified realm as much as possible. There's all sorts of media reports out there, but what can you talk about, Under Secretary Krebs, in this open forum about what happened in Arizona? I know you weren't there, but what your organization knows about what happened in Arizona, when, uh, how it was detected, who was informed, what uh, was learned uh, from it, and uh, you know the lessons learned going forward. I just think it, there's a lot of confusion in the media, and it'd be helpful to clear that up. So th thank you for the question, and I'll go ahead and offer off you know at the beginning that we come in and provide a, a bit more of a detailed conversation for you. In in fact, for for Arizona, uh, it's one of the more challenging situations because it wasn't necessarily uh, related directly to uh, Russian activity. There there. Secretaries of state, uh, election officials, by their very nature, are natural risk managers. They deal with hurricanes, power outages, <laughs> civil unrest, and criminals that want to get access to personally identifiable information that, that may reside within voter registration databases. So every attack, particularly those that we, or, or incident that we've seen over the last couple months even, um, is, it's not always Russia. And that's one of the, the unfortunate um, aspects of the of the climate right now is that every time you see some sort of disruption whether it's intentional malicious accidental it, it, it the everyone's jumping to the conclusion of it's Russia uh, there are things that happen on a daily basis in elections that that just that just happened. So, so, so in Arizona, can, can you just be clear? Uh, I mean, and, and by the way, in Russia, criminal elements are often acting on behalf of the state. Yes, ma'am. So let's not be fooled. But we, we do have criminals here in the United States yes. as well. Uh, so <laughs> at this point, uh, given the kind of confidential nature of some of these conversations, I can't get too much into uh, the Arizona piece, but I, again, I'd like to follow up with your office on that and see. Yeah, and, a little and bit I would like to let again the the key of openness and transparency, so people understand, and it can help build their faith in the system that nothing was manipulated, but what's been learned from it, and what are we doing going forward? Yes, ma'am. And uh, again, we understand that in all the. Uh, hacks that did happen, nothing was manipulated, but it doesn't mean it couldn't have been manipulated. And just because it hasn't happened yet in 2018 doesn't mean it can't happen between now and Election Day, if they choose to, right? Threat equals capability plus intent. Uh, and even though someone can cast a provisional ballot, if a zip code was turned around and jumbled up or their street address if we don't know that that happened, then the provisional ballot will be thrown out. Or if their voter file was deleted, they'll cast a provisional ballot, it'll be compared, and they say it's not a voter, and it'll be thrown out. So, so just the, you know, I have a concern about the detection and the swift capability moving forward for this election and beyond. Uh, because on election day, if the lines are getting longer and people are hearing something's not right, that in and of itself meets the intent of uh, of the enemy, right? That they're sowing confusion and discord. So can you just talk a little bit about that? Because again, just because they haven't done it yet doesn't mean they can't do it tomorrow. That That's 100% right. And, and that's why we're not necessarily looking back um, at specifics. We are looking back at the, two, the specifics of 2016, but given our broader understanding of the IT environments that support elections, we are looking at more broadly where the vulnerabilities are just in the system in general, and what are the things we can do to address those vulnerabilities broadly. It's not just Arizona, it's obviously all 50 states. So um, I, the thing that I will reiterate is we are seeing, as I've traveled across the country through primary season, I am continually impressed by the level of seriousness that secretaries of state and state election directors are paying to this issue. Uh, they want more information. They want more threat information. Mm -hmm. They want more information about how they can understand and manage their risk. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks. And look, we we manage all this at the county level. We do have our secretary of state role as well. We're from Arizona. We're generally skeptical of the federal government being involved in anything. Uh, we're you know we're very independent minded. Uh, and so, uh, is, how is your relationship uh, you know with the state there and and the, un the understanding of the role that you have while still allowing this to be localized and distributed, which is where it belongs? So we, we do have a relationship with Arizona. Um, we're engaging on a regular basis. I think, uh, as I mentioned, they're a member of the uh, Election Infrastructure ISAC. Uh, every state's different. 
every architect of a system is different, um, the threat model is going to be different. Um, and Arizona is different than Rhode Island. Mm -hmm. So um, I look forward to following up with you. My time yes, has expired, but specifically, th thanks a lot. Appreciate it. General A. Yields a uh, General A. from New York. Ms. Rice is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Krebs, last week the Senate Intelligence Committee issued a bipartisan report that concurred with the intelligence community's January 2017 assessment that the Russian government interfered in the 2016 election to support the Trump campaign. Do you agree with the Senate Intelligence Committee and the intelligence community's assessment? Yes, ma'am. Have you shared your opinion with the president? Uh, I have not had the opportunity to meet with the president uh, directly about this issue. I've been in briefings with the president on this issue, uh, but I have not directly engaged him on, on that. Do you think that this is an important enough issue to engage him on this issue, since he has repeatedly refused to accept the conclusion of his own intelligence community? Ma'am, res residing within a technical agency where I do at the undersecretary level, I'm not often afforded the opportunity to meet with the president. And I, I, I don't say this jokingly. It's, it's that I you know, engage on a daily basis with... Have you spoken movement. to the secretary and suggested to her that she speak directly to the president? Uh, yes, ma'am. We I meet with the secretary regularly on this issue, and she she has directly briefed the, sec uh, the president on this issue. The Justice Department and Special Counsel Robert Mueller charged 13 Russian nationals and three Russian companies in February with various crimes related to interfering in the 2016 election, including stealing the identities of American citizens. Do you believe that Special Counsel Mueller's investigation is a witch hunt? I, Ma'am, can, can, can you repeat the question? I'm trying yeah. to understand. Yes, I will. The Justice Department and Special Counsel Robert Mueller charged 13 Russian nationals and three Russian companies in February with various crimes related to interfering in the 2016 election, which is what we've been talking about here, including stealing the identities of American citizens. Do you believe that Special Counsel Mueller's investigation is a witch hunt, yes or no? I certainly don't think that charging the Internet Research Agency and those that supported interfering with the election a witch hunt, no ma'am. So that is a no, you do not believe it is a witch hunt. I the 13 indictments you just indicated, I right. do not believe that those are witch hunts. I think those are legitimate. Mueller's investigation into at least that portion of it. Yes, ma'am. I'm the, not aware of the rest of the investigation. Do you think the overall investigation is a witch hunt? Ma'am, I'm not aware of the, the scope and extent of the, inf uh, of the investigation. Again, I engage every day with state and local election officials on securing their systems. I, you know, I read what I can in the paper. I'm not privy to uh, Special Counsel Mueller's investigation and the well, scope of it. Well, in your position, it. you should know more than you are at least attributing yourself knowledge of. Will President Trump be discussing Russian interference in the 2016 election in his meeting with President Vladimir Putin next week? Uh, based on the press reports that I've seen, uh, yes, ma'am, that's part of the agenda. Well, I, I would assume that before that meeting, the president is going to sit down with his top uh, people, one of whom is your boss, direct boss, Secretary Nielsen. Will you recommend to Secretary Nielsen, since you don't get direct FaceTime, I guess, to talk to the president, will you be recommending to her that she recommend to the president that he discuss Russian interference in U.S. elections with President Putin? Again, based on press reports, that will be part of the conversation. Of course, I would you suggest if I, if I had that conversation with the secretary. Do you think you should have that conversation with her? Again, I speak to the secretary about this matter on almost a daily you basis, specifically and we've talked encouraged about it. This issue that I'm asking you about, whether she is going to recommend, as one of his advisors, that he should bring this up in a serious manner with President Putin. I would yes. recommend that, yes, ma'am. Okay. So just a, a, a clarification. Why DHS countering foreign influence task force, how, how it's different from the FBI foreign influence task force, we can debate that all day long, but why is there not just one comprehensive task force? on this critical issue? So I think the challenge here is that uh, from an information operations perspective of what Russia's uh, launch over the last couple of years, uh, the government is not necessarily directly organized uh, from a, from a there's no single set of jurisdictions, frankly. Uh, these issues like the, um, the FBI's law enforcement uh, authorities, my authorities to meet with private sector companies and, and build awareness and, uh, um, uh, resilience within the system. 
we are working towards something like you're suggesting, whether it's a single task force, but we do coordinate on a regular basis. I meet at the undersecretary level on an almost weekly basis with my counterparts and a number of different agencies. There are meetings in the National Security Council and there are staff technical level meetings between DHS, the FBI, the, Gov uh, the Global Engagement Center. Thank you. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. General Lee yields. Uh, the uh, let's see, gentleman from Nebraska, Mr. Bacon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I thank you both for being here today. <clears throat> I just want to ask uh, Under Secretary Krebs a, a question for clarity. I think you've been touching on it a little bit. I just want to make sure we have it right. Is there anything else you need from Congress, whether it's resources, uh, the you know, budget, the appropriations, or so forth? Is there anything else you need from us to safeguard our election systems from hacking or manipulation? So I think from a, thank you for the question. I think from a, from a pure authorities perspective, I think we have everything we need to support state and local governments in their election. Uh, I think with more from a resourcing perspective, I could always do more. Uh, but we are learning uh, from our past uh, engagements, whether it's risk and vulnerability assessments or some of the other capabilities that we're providing. Uh, the 26.2 million we were provided in the omnibus, uh, the FY18 omnibus, certainly helped uh, increase our bandwidth, uh, not just for election systems, but also in those other infrastructure sectors that Congressman Langevin mentioned. So we're always looking at how to be more efficient in the things we do and make sure that we are operating off of, of, of requirement set. The, the last thing I'd add on that front is, um, given the nature of a public-private partnership, uh, everything has to be based on a demand signal, as, as we're calling it. Um, the relationship, frankly, between state officials has only really been at what I would say a um, healthy level for not even a year now, maybe about a year now. And it's still we're still defining what the requirement sets are. And that is going to be something over the next six months, particularly in kind of the hot wash after 2018, we'll get back to, we'll pause, mm -hmm. reflect, do a hot wash, figure out where we need to go going forward. One of the problems we hear is that our state and local officials don't have the right clearances to work with some of these things. Are we getting that problem solved? Are we making progress? We are. Uh, we have taken uh, a pretty hard look at the clearance process. I think at this point we've got about 37 states uh, that have a senior election official with the clearance, nine more in the processing. Uh, a handful are, have declined for whatever reason, and they may have other officials in the state that have access to the information. Others are still in the decision-making process. Very, It's a limited number. But I'll, I'll also kind of pull back on the clearance piece a little bit. As I mentioned earlier, we are doing everything possible we can to take things or to operate in the unclassified space. Mm -hmm. I'd also suggest that the classified information piece and the clearance issue is not necessarily... Uh, the driving factor for our engagements. In a year and a half ago, or in 2016, having never met Secretary Gorbea, if I'd called her up and said, you need to take care of this system right now, she'd have said, I don't know who you are. I'm not going to do that. I have no reason to trust you. Now, if I called her up and said, hey, look, we're seeing something. You need to take care of this problem. Based on the trust and the relationship we've developed, even without a clearance, I have fairly good confidence that Secretary Gorbea would, would at least give me a flyer, and then we'd follow up afterwards. <laughs> One last uh, question here. We're seeing more and more attacks from Russia against Ukraine's critical infrastructure, and it seems to me they're using it as a test bed to practice their techniques and capabilities. Uh, would, would, first of all, would you agree with that? And secondly, are we, what are we learning from watching what Russia is doing with Ukraine? Because clearly... Those same capabilities are using their their study and us to do the same if they need to. I, I think that's a fair assessment that Ukraine is is perhaps a, a pilot or a test bed. Uh, in terms of what we're learning, they're getting better. You know, each subsequent incident uh, shows a uh, increased level of capability. So what we're doing is. Um, sitting back and looking at, okay, what is the capability that they've demonstrated? And what are the corresponding vulnerabilities or ex our exposure, our risk level here in the United States? And then how do we uh, work with our critical infrastructure community to help them uh, understand that risk and do the things they need to do? And how can we help them do that? And one of the things that I think I, I, we, we need to move 
beyond information sharing. Information sharing is the foundation of how you manage risk. What we need to do and continue to move into is a risk management integration space. Uh, and this is the importance of uh, avoiding these silos because increasingly these systems, whether it's industrial control systems uh, or just general IT systems, are almost agnostic to sectors, or at least they cut across several sectors. So we need to be working cross-sector, government industry together to do integrated risk assessments, integrated uh, strategic planning, and inter integrated uh, risk mitigation strategies. So uh, there's a lot more ahead of us, and this is one of the things that we're really focusing on right now at NPPD. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Uh, gentleman yields back. The gentleman from California, Mr. Correa, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First of all, uh, Honorable Krebs, Honorable Correa, I want to thank you for being here today. And I also want to thank you for the good job you're doing. I know sometimes it goes unappreciated, but uh, uh, we're relying on you, okay? <laughs> I wanted to follow up, uh, you know, in this committee, we talk about best practices when it comes to cybersecurity, financial institutions. I would presume that right now across the 50 states, we have some kind of semblance of coordination where those best practices are being applied at every one of those 50 states when it comes to uh, the elections? Yes, sir. Through the Election Infrastructure uh, Information Sharing and Analysis Center, it's basically to kind of unpack what that means. Is it is a, it's a group of all 50 states, including other uh, election officials, that are connected in a manner that if, if one has a best practice or an observation they want to share, then all 50 or all uh, almost what about 1,000. In a situation where we've had recently that you have a cyber attack on financial institutions within nanoseconds, everybody's on top of it so that yeah. people figure out that there's actually an attack going on and, and people can respond L to let it. Me, let me actually give you a practical example from the election community. Yes, sir. Uh, a few months ago, there was a phishing attack, uh, not necessarily attributed to a nation state, but a phishing attack on a state election system. Uh, what happened is that that state detected the phishing attack, worked with DHS, and then we were able to share indicators across the ISAC. Now, did this happen in a matter of seconds or even minutes? No. Mm -hmm. But what we gain through this approach of community <clears throat> or collective defense is broader uh, community. Will you be able to get there eventually? I know there's a lot of issues, costs, software, hardware. Will you be able to get to that level when you have an attack, you're able to respond almost immediately? I think ultimately that is our aspiration, of course. And, and I asked that question uh, following up Ms. McSally's point, which is trust. I'm from the state of California. We're like Arizona. We mistrust the federal government, but we try to work with the federal government. And, and yet, really, in these elections, it, the issue is trust. Mm -hmm. If you wake up Wednesday morning and somebody fried your software system and there's questions of the validity of those election results, we're going to have major challenges to our democracy in this country. And you know, I'm trying to, in my mind, trying to figure out what can we do to help you to make sure that that's not a reality one of these Wednesday mornings. So, so if I may, from the yes. state level, um, so I think it's, it's this risk mitigation, right? We can't just rely on we're going to put a wall around our systems, and that's going to protect us from everything. And that comes back to the issue of ultimately you come back to paper ballots. As paper being ballots are absolutely critical in my opinion. Uh, people ask me all the time, do you think online voting you know, should happen? And I'm like, no, not really, because I, for one, even though despite it. Most of the folks I know that show up to in California to vote actually vote electronically. So I know that California is a very large state with many different uh, systems. Yes, I know that Secretary yes. Padilla has been doing a fantastic job. I'll let him know you said that. Um, but going back to, I mean, but we talked about provisional ballots, for example, right? So say something happens and you show up and your name's not on the voter registry. That is as important in my mind to look at what is our provisional balloting system as it is what the machines are. Because the machines are, are in a sense easy. You can come in, you can buy them, you put them, you install them. But then what if they don't work? What if somebody sabotages them? What is that next step? We have very different provisional ballot systems in this country. And in Rhode Island, that is a very simple Do you think that's system. a formula for major chaos one of these Wednesday mornings? 
that everybody has their own different way of doing it. This is state of Florida hanging chads all over again. I think it's worth examining it. I understand that given that 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 while this and I only have 40 seconds left. That's trying to be you know uh, quick here, but uh, I'd like to talk to you a little bit more on this. I used to chair elections in mm -hmm. when I was in the state senate in California, so we dealt with these issues a little bit, not to the extent we're dealing with them now. But uh, my final question, and this is one for you, maybe to answer, not to answer for us here. At what point does a foreign nation's interference in our electoral system constitute a declaration of war in our country? I think, uh, I think that is the right policy question we need to have right now. Uh, I don't have an answer for you. I Thank agree. You. I think that is one of the critical questions we need to ask. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I yield. The gentleman yields, I, and I appreciate that question. We've been trying to define that for quite some time was an act of cyber warfare. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I appreciate you raising that. Uh, the gentleman from New York, Mr. Donovan. And I am your last uh, questioner. Um, At least on this side. Yes. Uh, <laughs> the, the title of the, of the hearing was DHS's Progress in Securing Election Systems and Other Critical Infrastructure. I'd just like to ask about the other critical infrastructure for a moment since you're both here. And uh, Secretary Corbera, you, you, you said before in your opening statement about balancing our needs for secrecy with our need for transparency, very difficult thing to do. Uh, Mr. Krebs, during you know, some of the other attacks that we've seen on our healthcare systems, our dams, our oil and natural gas systems, the cyber attacks on, on our energy um, industries, how do we balance that need for secrecy and transparency? And how do we as a, a government share vulnerabilities with private industry. We all have this same common goal here is to pr protect our energy system, our electrical grids. Um, but then again, there's a, a difficulty, I suspect, with, um, with industry, particularly those who have competitors, of revealing that they're vulnerable. Um, they don't want to lose the confidence of their clients or their their um, their users. So how do how do we balance that stuff? I know it's not an easy question. There's not an easy answer for that. But since I'm on the last one on this side of the aisle, um, we'll throw you a hardball. That's a Thanks. <laughs> that's a great question. Uh, the way I kind of break this up right now, at least, is to look at opportunistic attacks and then more strategic adversary attacks. So when you think about what happened last summer or last fall with WannaCry, the U.S. was generally not. Um, terribly affected, unlike some of our European counterparts and look at what happened in Russia and elsewhere. Um, the reason for that was in part because we did a fairly good job, I think, in a government industry partnership of sharing information, indicators, working with the security researcher community to see what they saw. And then there were some security researchers that took certain activities to help out. But, but it started before WannaCry even launched in that we had raise the level of awareness. We'd worked with, whether it was the government doing it or just in general, the level of awareness. Um, people had done the, the right cyber hygiene basics to protect their systems. They had patched their operating systems. They had patched their software so that the majority of the vulnerabilities had been closed out. So from an opportunistic perspective, I think we're, we are certainly making progress. We're improving now. This is always a question of um, resourcing. I've said that before today. Uh, when we think about the re recent rash of ransomware attacks, those are similarly opportunistic attacks. Uh, Colorado, Atlanta, Baltimore, Mecklenburg County, Charlotte. Those were all attacks that had been, you know, they were scanned, the systems were scanned, they'd found vulnerabilities, they went in, locked them up, and said, I want $50,000. That is an example of not necessarily doing the basics. Uh, so we are really stressing to prevent opportunistic attacks, which is generally speaking about 85% of the, this, these are you know soft numbers, not empirically based, but good enough to go by for the purposes of this discussion of you do the basics right and you can drive most of the bad actors out of the space, the, the general uh, hackers. Now from a strategic perspective, we do know as, as I talked with uh, Congressman Bacon earlier, we do know that the uh, adversary is getting better 
particularly in our hard infrastructure space. We, they, we saw them last summer. We released a report earlier this year uh, along with the FBI on uh, Russian activity and infrastructure. We saw them in energy, critical manufacturing, transportation, aviation. We're currently seeing them principally in the information technology side, the IT side. Now, the problem is once they get more uh, com- more comfortable operating in the operational technology side. So that's where we're focusing right now. And I mentioned earlier, we talked about siloing. We talked about uh, the shift from information sharing to uh, risk management. That is where we are driving a great deal of our effort right now. It's taking a piece of threat intelligence. Like I know the amount of intelligence I see on a daily basis, it's overwhelming. But what I need to do a better job of working with industry is saying, this piece of intelligence, so what? What does it mean? What does it mean to that system, this system, to the nation, to a region? Figuring that piece out and then asking the question, what are we going to do about it? That is principally where we're focused and we're kicking off a new initiative within NPPD, the National Risk Management Initiative, that is really going to focus in on moving beyond intelligence and into risk management, of understanding what the problem is, how to address it, and doing it in a cross-sector, government-industry partnership manner. And I think that's where we're going to make the most significant uh, gain. You're right. I thank you both for your service. I yield, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Gentleman yields. Uh, Gentleman from California, Ms. Berrigan, is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you both for being here today. Um, uh, Secretary Cribbs, um, I wanted to ask, um, last month, I believe, the Senate Intelligence Committee had put out a report called Russia Targeting of Election Infrastructure During the 2016 Election. I uh, assume you've seen that? Yes, ma'am. Um, in that report, um, there was um, a paragraph, a sentence that uh, said, although the DHS provided warning to IT staff in the fall of 2016, Notifications to state election officials were delayed by nearly a year. That's pretty startling um, to read. And I think I hear from um, local elected officials that's concerning that the federal government knew of something, yet they didn't get notice of it. And I think I even read about North Carolina having problems on election day and them having no idea um, about the possible uh, breaches and concerns that were happening. What are you doing to make sure that doesn't happen again? So on the top end, we have established a series of information sharing protocols working with the Government Coordinating Council uh, to say, hey, when we get something or we see something, these are the five officials in each state and the system owner mm-hmm. that we would that we would notify. Secretary Gorbet mentioned it earlier. You know, a year ago, or even before that, they were trying to figure out the cybersecurity side of it. DHS was trying to figure out the election side of it. We're past that. We've really committed to working together. We've built partnerships. We've established trust. And we're really getting to that point of understanding what they need from us. And we're reacting accordingly. So I have great confidence that if we did see something, that I would know exactly who to go to in each state uh, to share that information. We will not be in a position like we were in 2016 when, frankly, we were in kind of uncharted territory, for us at the time at least. So are you suggesting that the then undersecretary didn't know who to call at these um, any states? There was no no election infrastructure subsector. So these relationships were not established at the time. Uh, so my predecessor, pre- predecessor who I've spoken with about this, uh, they what they did was follow uh, a traditional in, uh, incident response uh, protocol. Uh, they they notified the state or the asset owner, which may have been a county or may have been a private sector uh, uh, owner operator, and that is that's the playbook. Going through the process now, we understand that this is a unique uh, uh, community. This is a unique subsector. And what works in other sectors doesn't work here. And we've changed our protocols accordingly. Um, and is, in D- is DHS in a position to detect if there's such meddling happening in all of the 50 states? In other words, does DHS have any visibility into whether relevant state systems are being targeted? So since, frankly, February of this year, we have quadrupled our insight into 
uh, state activities. We, we have an uh, intrusion detection system that's called ALBERT. It's similar to a system the federal government uses that uh, we have deployed out. Now, I mentioned 21 states earlier. In part, those 21 states, uh, we saw that activity because of the deployed ALBERT sensors uh, at the time. Uh, like I mentioned, we have quadrupled our insights since just February of this year. By the midterms uh, of, uh, by, by November of this year, we will have almost every state covered down on, uh, and we will have uh, significant coverage across counties and other jurisdictions. Okay. Um, my understanding is that there's no nationally mandated security requirements for election technology vendors, um, nor are they subject to a consistent set of breach notification laws. Um, how would you characterize uh, DHS's relationship with election-related vendors? So uh, we, there's actually a complementary group called the Sector Coordinating Council. So on the Government Coordinating Council, you have state election, uh, lo and local election officials. And then on the Sector Coordinating count, Council side, we have uh, vendors with all the, all the major technology providers to elections. Uh, we, frankly, we, we took a kind of an incremental approach. We, we started building strong relationships with uh, the state partners and local partners, and, and we're moving. Uh, we have this sector coordinating council uh, established, and the relationships are, are growing. Uh, they're not, frankly, probably where they need to be, but they're getting there. And my last question to you, sir, is um, we know that the president doesn't believe in the meddling, and, and you've already indicated you believe the intelligence reports. What does it do to morale, to the people under you, um, to know that the the, their commander, the top guy, doesn't even believe that there was any meddling when that's what you guys are doing. You got, your mission is to go out and stop it from happening and um, from prevent it, preventing you know, them to interfere in our democracy. What does that do to the people under you? I think generally speaking, the morale of my team is, is uh, really high right now. I think the ability to work with folks like Secretary Gorbea, uh, we... We are we are a, a, a the way I see it a high functioning organization. So you don't see an impact at all from the president speak about this to your team. I'm just saying in general the the morale of my team is very high. Great, thank you. Gentleman yields the uh, gentleman from uh, Massachusetts, Mr. Keating, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to thank you for being here. Um, just a question, uh, oh. since I had a conflicting hearing, uh, but what's the attitude? Uh, uh, range of attitude among uh, local and state officials uh, when you're uh, saying we're here to give you some help. Some of them say, don't worry, I have it covered. I'm confident our system is, is fine. Is that something you hear? Uh, every state is a different experience. No, but have you heard that? That's what I asked. I have heard some states say we have, we are resourced. Uh, I've been told rather that some states have said, we have the resources, the capabilities. Are you yes. just waiting to? Do you, have you reached out to all the states? We've engaged officials? every single okay, state. So you've heard back from those officials, or you? Yes, sir. So some some of them just feel confident, no problem, got it covered. Some st every state is working with DHS in some capacity. I, well, I know that. I just asked what your experience was. I mean, it's not a tough question. It's just, are you getting back feedback? Don't worry, I'm confident, I've got it covered mm. from those officials. I, yes, sir. I think some states feel that they have uh, they're adequately resourced or uh, adequately supported. Others, uh, like insurance policies, and even though they may have things covered, they'll still you know, take some. Do, of do our you services. think that uh, uh, we're going to be attacked in four months by Russia, uh, sir? I don't have any information or evidence to suggest they're going to attack do, us, do, but we don't need do that. You share information I, with our intelligence officials, then they share with me. Yes, well, sir. I'm not. They a collector. believe we're going to be attacked. So you don't have uh, an opinion? I, so I, I don't think I've seen that uh, assessment that they're going to attack our election, that the, you know, you haven't heard that Corbea. from our intelligence officials? Uh, US intelli you haven't heard that one? I have, and I, you know, I, maybe I need to go back and review, yeah, but. I think so. I think, I think our sir, I think what they've said is that. Yes, they're going to do it again. I think what they. Meaning what, Russia. Yes, sir. Russia. I think they, uh, Russia is engaging in information operations. Uh, whether it's focused well, on elections or not. Maybe I'm wrong. No, I, no I, saying, sir, I'm not suggesting They're going to do it again. You don't believe they're going to do it again? Uh, I wouldn't put agree with past, our intelligence I wouldn't officials? put anything past the Russians. I'm, I'm not disagreeing with any intelligence. I'm just, I what I'm saying is... I'm just saying, don't you agree with our intelligence I, people that are saying... Uh, yes, sir. I wow, agree that with our tough. intelligence community. <laughs> Sorry about that, but uh, are we sufficiently ready for this attack? Can you, what kind of guarantee can you give us that we're up to the task? 
Uh, I have confidence in the resilience of the system. I have, I think, some of the controlling measures that we have in place, whether it's provisional ballots, as we discussed, or some of the other compensating controls. I think, uh, you know, is, is it 100% secure? Can you guarantee secure? it? No. Uh, of course not. No. And it's likely that there could be some difficulty. It's in the realm of possibility, correct? Sir, I, I, you know, I'm paid to be paranoid. I plan for bad days, and uh, that's what we're working towards. Yeah, well, uh, have you reached out uh, as a rule and communicated the fact that it's likely we're going to be attacked now that you know that, uh, and, and we'll be, we, in fact, will be attacked? And number two, that despite the great efforts at mitigating this, that can't cover that, uh, have you reached out to all our officials and said, uh, we believe strongly you should move to paper ballots? Uh, it is a baseline recommendation of the department, uh, working with the GCC and others, that, yeah, uh, paper trails, verifiable, auditable paper trails are a best practice, period. Yeah. Secretary uh, Gorbea, what, what are you with your colleagues uh, nationwide? What are you hearing back? I mean, to me, this is a strong statement that should come from despite our efforts, uh, you know, our best efforts at trying to mitigate this, that there should be paper ballots. I, I mean, that's, that's the, what we should be doing, frankly. I wholeheartedly agree, and I give a lot of credit to Congressman Landman uh, for when he was a Secretary of State, he started us on this paper ballot process uh, for, with optical scan readers. And when I came into office, the, those, that equipment was uh, outdated, and we replaced it with similar, because there should always be something that you can touch and feel that you and I can look at and say, this is how the voter wanted to Particularly go. provisional ballots, because if they do get in the infrastructure and they can manipulate data, those provisional ballots are going to be critical. That's right. But that's where looking at the, system, the various systems and rules around provisional ballots are really important. Because in Rhode Island, those provisional ballots are reviewed by election officials. Mm -hmm. Has our government, uh, U.S. government, federal government, mm -hmm. uh, communicated to all election officials sufficiently, in your opinion, that there will be an attack that there are uh, efforts to mitigate it, but you can't, no guarantees there they can be successful. You should move to paper ballots. Has it been that strong a message, or is it just a recommendation? I, I, I think we are all in this space very concerned about making sure that we mitigate the risk. We don't need necessarily the federal government to tell us this because we see it everywhere. And so I think all states are taking measures. How many states are moving to paper ballots? It's four months away. I don't have the answer to that, but the National Association of Secretaries of State you might be able to Secretary provide that. So I know that five states right now are exclusively on non-paper ballot systems. Of those five, four are in the RFP process. Uh, one is, you know, waiting for money, frankly. So it's pretty prevalent that it's going to be paper ballot. That's reassuring. Uh, it, it, so uh, I think on the balance, uh, there are paper ballots, but there, but there are still systems out there that do not have paper ballots. Percentage again? Uh, off the top of my head, I don't have percentages. I, I suggest that's something we should know. And, and that would be so happy to something you could do that. Yes, sir. Happy to circle back with the, and work with the Election that would Assistance be Commission and the Secretary. I realize your limitations. Uh, I appreciate your testimony and your, and your good work. Uh, as a last comment, uh, dealing with the Russians, uh, our intelligence said they're doing it again. We have to have deterrence uh, as well as uh, a rope-a-dope approach where we're just doing our best to mitigate it. Uh, I hope that's done. I know it's not in your specific purview. It's certainly not yours at the state level. But in the interim, uh, I think we should give the strongest message, message possible for paper ballots. That will deter them in, in the actual infrastructure uh, apparatus attempts uh, to get into our system. And, and on a larger scale, I believe very strongly that the sanctions and the deterrence that we have at the upper levels uh, are critical. So uh, thank you for your work. I yield back. Joe Neal is the gentleman lady from um, Texas. Ms. Jackson Lee is recognized. Let me thank the chairman and ranking member for holding uh, this hearing. Uh, and uh, to the witnesses, uh, let me thank you as well. Uh, committee business uh, in uh, judiciary uh, proceeding on issues that dealt with the 2016 election delayed me. But uh, this is an important hearing, and I want to follow the line of reasoning of uh, my, uh, my colleague, Mr. Keating, and maybe in a different perspective. To both of you, let me thank you for the service that you give. But I believe that um, this will be um, a federal election uh, in a large way. Uh, the Congress will be up for re-election, uh, the House in totality, the Senate partially. So this is a federal election, and uh, I have the greatest respect for state officers, and they are our collaborators. But I would say to uh, the Secretary, 
uh, that um, it is the responsibility of the federal government to at least provide the structure and the uh, walls of security upon which you can work within or even add to uh, by your own expertise. And with that in mind, uh, I frankly believe that this government has not been effective in recognizing the larger picture, and that is the enormous involvement and invasion that Russia perpetrated in 2016 and in elections before that, where we probably did not have all of the analysis. And I do not believe that we are uh, solidly in control and facing what is the potential of uh, invasion, interference, and altering and skewing of the election uh, by uh, the Russians and maybe some others. And I don't believe in particular that the commander in chief has been particularly effective uh, in acknowledging uh, that invasion in 2016. And I would hope uh, in his meeting uh, that I certainly have concern with, with Vladimir Putin, uh, that that will be um, number one in his agenda. Um, Secretary uh, Krebs, do you know whether the president will be discussing election fraud, election uh, challenges uh, in uh, his meeting with the um, head of Russia? Yes, ma'am. That's my understanding. Have you given him or the Secretary of Homeland Security, I don't know if uh, she is there, but uh, the State Department, uh, those are our diplomats. Have you given him a matrix, a list of questions or information to the White House that he will be well informed in his questioning? Uh, Ma'am, I personally have not, and I would need to get back to you on whether the secretary But has. you think it would be important that those questions be raised? I think that that is a useful conversation. Yes, ma'am. I hope more than useful. Let me... Stern warning. Yes, ma'am. Earlier this year, I introduced H.R. 3202, the Cyber Vulnerability Disclosure Reporting Act, which passed the House earlier this year with the help of uh, this committee and the chairman and ranking member. The bill requires the Secretary of Homeland Security to submit a report on the policies and procedures developed for coordinating cyber vulnerability disclosures. The report will include an annex with information on instances in which cybersecurity vulnerability disclosure policies and procedures were used to disclose details on identified weaknesses in computing sciences or digital services at risk. The report will provide information on the degree to which the information provided by DHS was used by industry and other stakeholders in a uh, closed setting. The reason I worked on this bill before the full house for consideration is a problem often referred to as zero day events. Zero day event describes a situation that network security professionals may find themselves um, when a previously unknown error or flaw in computing code is exploited by a cyber criminal or terrorist or someone who wants to undermine our elections. Uh, that is the level that I think we may be at at some point in our election. So Mr. Secretary, I ask you, uh, do you, in fact, have the kind of infrastructure, DHS, uh, that can be prepared for catastrophic events dealing with the nation's democracy, these elections? DHS employees stand on the front lines of federal government efforts to defend our nation's critical infrastructure from natural disasters, terrorism, adversarial threats, technological risks, such as those caused by cyber threats. So my concern would be um, elections uh, that I hope are classified as critical infrastructure are you confident that you have a team uh, that if the secretary um, from Rhode Island reaches out, even with her good works, to the federal government, where are we in protecting election, detecting Russia invasion, and uh, altering our election system? So generally speaking, I think we have uh, a team that is elastic in that we can focus on a number of different infrastructure sectors, and when an acute need arises, we can surge into a specific uh, sector like, in, like election infrastructure. So if I got that call from Secretary Gorbea, and she needed a fly-in team of X number of people, we could deliver that. Um, with more, though, I can, of course, do more. And so we are taking a look at what the threat picture looks like, what our ability to manage risk across the country is, and uh, the, the demand signal from our stakeholders. All of our engagements are voluntary in this space. So I have to have a requirement set. I have to have a demand signal. If Secretary Gorbea needs something, and if I get 49 other secretaries that say they need something, that compounds into a very clear demand. So do we need to write legislation to give you requirements of uh, indicia that says this is when you shoot into a state that is impacted by what they think is a cyber threat in their elections, 
uh, and you need to dispatch. Are you voluntarily sending staff there, I, or you have legislative authority? I think is a I have legislative authority to send folks uh, on incident response capabilities. That was and already resources. been provided. And uh, resources. So it depends on the level of the incident. You know, we don't have uh, a thousand people sitting on a bench waiting for a phone call. Uh, we have folks that are providing incident response capabilities. They're providing hunt capabilities, uh, uh, risk and vulnerability assessments. Uh, it is, it's base, you know, we, like I said, elasticity is critical here because folks can do something on Monday and then do something different on Tuesday. Well, we Mr. Will Secretary, be um, it was humorous to say a thousand people on the bench. Uh, some of us uh, are very much into sports and uh, we'd like to have a thousand so we could substitute out those who are not working. But the point is, <laughs> uh, it may be a thousand, uh, you know, this is a big nation, 300 million plus, and it may be a thousand incidences in the middle of a high profile election. I consider the federal elections uh, certainly the highest profile, although uh, state elections, governors, state legislators, and others certainly are part of the democratic infrastructure. What I am saying is, with all seriousness, that I believe that you should be prepared in this infrastructure scheme, and there are many others. I could be talking about the electric grid and others. I don't have the time to do so, but I want to focus because I don't believe that the administration, and you're next part of it, I'm not saying your direct office, has given this the attention and the sensitivity and seriousness that I frankly believe um, puts you in the seat, along with the Secretary of Homeland Security, to get those 1,000 people on the bench, and if they're needed from C to signing she, signing she see that we're able to protect the election uh, of the voters of the American people. That's, that's what I'm trying to hear from you. Yes, ma'am, I understand your concern. I, I'll tell you this much, and, and hopefully the experience is validated by Secretary Gorbea, but I spend 40 to 50% of my time right now almost exclusively on elections. There is no way I could take this any more seriously than I do, and my team sees that. We have capabilities across this organization that are able to surge into the space. So when we think about midterms, when we think about November, there are protective security advisors distributed across this country, 130 or 40 of them. I've got cybersecurity advisors distributed across this country. On any given day, they're working across the 16 sectors. In November, they will be focused on election infrastructure. That's just that group. I have other folks in DC that will be focusing on elections. So we are able to surge into the space. That said, I can always do more uh, with more, I can always do more. So we are continuing to work with our stakeholders to understand what it is they need from us, and then that refines our resource requirements. I, in, I thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm yielding back. I'd ask the Secretary to think of an SOS number uh, that could be given out as we move toward elections. If I'm out in the field and somebody says I'm totally collapsed and my local people can't find out why they're collapsed or what's going on, or whether we should move to provisional, it would be helpful to have that one SOS number. Yes, uh, with that... Mr. Chair, Mr. Secretary, will you take that under advisement or be able to say yes? Yes, ma'am. All right. Thank you very much. I yield back. Thank no you. I yield. Um, I want to thank, does the ranking member have any closing? I'd like to thank our witnesses for being here today. I just want to conclude with a, a, a short um, personal experience. Over 20 years ago, I was a federal prosecutor at Maine Justice, and I uh, prosecuted a guy named Johnny Chung who led us to the director of uh, 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 Chinese intelligence. Um, who was acting on behalf of China Aerospace because he liked the uh, then President Clinton's position on uh, technology transfers. He put money into Johnny Chung's um, Hong Kong bank account to put into the presidential election. So my point is this is nothing new. Uh, foreign adversaries influencing our elections and presidential elections, I think has been going on for quite some time. I think now uh, they have found a new tool uh, to use and manipulate to do that, and that's the internet and cyberspace. Uh, so with that, I want to thank both of you uh, for your strong leadership on this issue. We take this very seriously in the Congress uh, on both sides of the aisle as we enter into the midterm elections. Uh, and if there's anything this committee can do to help you uh, in your efforts, uh, please let us know. Uh, members may have additional questions they may submit in writing. And pursuant to committee rule 7D, the hearing record will be stay open uh, for 10 days without objection. Committee stands adjourned.